Welcome to This Week in Hearing. Hello, I'm your host, Bob Trainer, for our special series called Giants in Audiology. This week, my special guest is Dr. Rich Tyler from the University of Iowa. I'm going to take a couple minutes and read Dr. Tyler's uh, bio. Rich Tyler was trained at the University of Western Ontario and the University of Iowa, and then became a scientist in charge of clinical outstation at the Institute for Hearing Research in Nottingham, England. He's a full professor of communication sciences and disorders and in otolaryngology at the University of Iowa. He's hosted international hearing aid and cochlear implant conferences and his 30th international conference on the management of tinnitus and hyperacusis patients. This will be held August 10th and 11th of this year. He states how he appreciates being able to help people with hearing loss, tinnitus, and hyperacusis. Welcome to Giants in Hearing, Rich, and thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you, an honor to be here. So, uh, so I, I understand that, that you grew up in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, and, and that's someplace south of Detroit, where a lot of us don't understand and things like that. Right, just south of Detroit, which most Americans can't understand, but it's actually true. Okay. And, uh, and, and sports at that time was quite a part of your life. Yes, I played uh, basketball and football and baseball. Sports was my life. I actually had a scholarship to play college football in Ontario, but I decided to turn it down. Football is kind of dangerous, actually. It can be. And uh, now, but as, as you're growing up, my understanding is your worst job was being a baseball umpire. But I don't think there's a lot of people that would have expected Rich Tyler to be a good humor man. Well, a uh, baseball umpire, no matter what you call, half the people don't like it. But the best job I ever had in my life was selling ice cream from a truck. I drove around the neighborhood same time every day. All the children were waiting for me and everybody liked me. It was the best job I ever had. Lots of fun selling <laughs> ice cream. And how, how much were ice cream cones at that time? Well, I think you could buy an ice cream cone for 15 cents or 25 cents. It was wow. uh, almost free. And that was Canadian, of course. <laughs> yes, Canadian. Okay. So, uh, but... But my understanding is that uh, that as you were growing up, you were a stutterer, and that had a major factor in shaping your career choices. Yes, absolutely. I was a stutterer and uh, had some therapy and had to deal with this in both elementary school and in high school. So it was uh, part of my life being a stutterer. But uh, by the time you hit 17, uh, you hiked all around Europe for four months or so, and uh, uh, that, that's an experience that, that many of us uh, would never have had the opportunity to do. Yeah, it was a long time ago. I think I might have been uh, 19 years old, but um, right in there. It was quite common in those days, uh, but I hitchhiked around Europe for four months. I slept in youth hostels, and I often slept outside. Uh, some people actually took me into their homes. It was, uh, again, it was quite common for people to be hip hitchhiking and uh, a great opportunity to meet people and see different countries and cultures. I actually walked through Checkpoint Charlie in Berlin wow. and to East Berlin at the time. Um, Norway, Greece, Spain, the United Kingdom. It was a very important part of my life. Um, four months uh, on my own, you know, exploring the world. Sure. So uh, now for your undergraduate experience, my understanding is you started at the University of Windsor for the first year and then moved on to other, other areas. Right. The, the University of Western Ontario were just starting their uh, speech pathology and audiology program, and I had applied and did not get accepted. Um, and then uh, one week into class, I got a phone call saying someone has dropped out and were I still interested in coming to University of Western Ontario in the speech pathology audiology program. 
And I said, I'll be there on Monday. So I changed my directions and went up to London, Ontario and started with the program there. You had some pretty good mentors there at the time, from what I understand as well. Yes, I did indeed. There was uh, Jim Stouffer, uh, John Booth, um, Bill Jovetich, who was had been trained and worked with um, Wendell Johnson from Iowa. And he actually helped me, uh, Bill Jovetich, with my stuttering. And um, in fact, when I got through the program, my stuttering was less important in my life. And I had been impressed with the teachers I had in the science of audiology. And so it changed my perspective on what I wanted my career to be as my stuttering became less important in my life. And, and so your, your, your bachelor's degree and your master's degree are from Western then, and, uh, and then moved on to looking, to looking for a PhD program. Right. So as I said, I was interested now in psychoacoustics. And uh, I think um, one of the top people in the time was David Green from Harvard. I applied to work with David Green, got accepted at Harvard. Uh, a few weeks before our school started, um, they sent me a list of names uh, and asked me if I knew any of these names on this list. And I didn't know any of them and let them know that. And then about a week before class started, I got a, another letter from them saying that I did not have enough classes in psychology to be accepted into the psychology course. So they was de they declined my position to go to Harvard and work with uh, David Green in psychoacoustics. But then, then you discovered the University of Iowa. Right. Well, I had uh, I had al already been accepted, also been accepted at the University of Iowa. Again, Bill Jovetich had told me what Iowa City was a nice place to live, and so I just decided, okay, so I. Drove to Iowa City, first day of classes, I walked in the front door of the building and went into um, Ken Mall's office, and he was shocked to see me because I had forgotten, I didn't realize I was supposed to acknowledge that I accepted their offer to work there uh, as a student. But in any event, he was very, very helpful and accommodating, and uh, so... I started off in the PhD program at the University of Iowa. You had some some pretty interesting uh, uh, people who have done very well that were your colleagues there uh, in the PhD program as well. Yeah, it was a wonderful program. We had uh, lots of interactions and lots of enjoyment together, working together. Uh, George Haskell, uh, Michael Gorga, Pat Stomakowicz, Paul Colaney, Larry Dizel and many others. It was really um, a wonderful opportunity to interact with the fellow students and learn from them as well. That was a, uh, a good time to be at Iowa from what I understand, because you had some fabulous uh, mentors that you all, all of you were working with at that point. Yeah, it worked out quite well. I was very, very impressed with the scholarship and the classes that we had. Arnold Small, David Lilly, Jim Curtis, uh, Paul Abbas, just uh, lots of very, very bright people. The classes were very enlightening and very helpful in my career. And probably uh, used a lot of your time as well to study and uh, because they, they weren't just the everyday hearing science course or the everyday kind of course. Those were, those were pretty uh, highly detailed and uh, uh, very kind of innovative courses at the time. Yes, they were very, you know, we had a whole course on psychoacoustics, for example. And you were involved with the journal club there, as from what I gather as well. Right. So um, one of the journal clubs we had was uh, working with, um, we had every two weeks, we had a, uh, would discuss a journal from, uh, JASA or American Speech and Hearing Association or some journal we look at and uh, we'd uh, anyways it was uh, my turn to bring the beer one evening and uh, Conrad Lundin and I drove over to the house we got talking about the um, talking about the article we disagreed we were kind of arguing in a nice way and 
uh, knocked on Abbas's door and walked in with a case of beer arguing. And it turns out it was the wrong house. It was the neighbor <laughs> house. And the family was sitting there eating eating uh, dinner. And here we walked in arguing with a case of beer. So that wasn't a very good idea. Well, that's doc students. You know, the, you're, 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 you're learning and interacting with each other and, and so on. But I understand that there was quite a quandary at, uh, at the University of Iowa. Uh, because you were also becoming a potter at the time. Yeah, that's true. So they um, they had uh, given me some uh, money to pay tuition, um, and in the end of the second year, beginning of the third year, I had taken all the courses I had to take, but I had to register as a full time student and spend the money. So I looked around and. Uh, decided I would take a pottery class. So it was kind of fun and interesting. And it turns out one of the professors somehow found out that this PhD student was taking a pottery class. And they actually had a special meeting, a faculty meeting, to determine what was going on and if this was appropriate or not and what they should do about me. It turns out I was an A student at that time. And... Uh, they decided to let me go. So I took two pottery classes. I'm not the best potter, but it was certainly was an interesting experience and uh, we had lots of fun. Well, um, one of the one of the things that we we have as a as a shot here is of uh, of some of your pottery. And of course, any of you who want to uh, contact Dr. Tyler, I'm sure that he has a few pots around there and they will be famous one day. Uh, <laughs> so so after the PhD program, um, you, uh, you ended up in England. And how did you get to the Institute of Research, uh, which at that time was part of the University of Nottingham? Right. So it was just starting. And uh, my parents were from uh, Great Britain. So I was hoping you know, to go and experience something. And there was a job open there. And I received the, the job to work at the Institute of Hearing Research when it was first starting. So that was quite a thrill for me. And um, a lot of very bright people at the time just getting started, Quentin Summerfield, Adrian Davis, Mark Haggard, and many more. So they were very hardworking people. They didn't have backgrounds in audiology or in psychoacoustics, which kind of surprised me but they were well-trained in other areas and focused on hearing and hearing loss. And I learned a lot from them and benefited from being able to work with them. You know, it, it, it's really interesting to, to see the colleagues that we all work with over the years because uh, many of them end up uh, doing some very interesting things. And one of your good friends, uh, Adrian Davis, I think, uh, had a, a pretty significant award at that time. Yes, he received the uh, British Empire Award, um, the Order of the British Empire Award, because he basically uh, nurtured uh, newborn hearing screening worldwide. And uh, I think that, that the success of newborn hearing screening, how it's done worldwide, uh, can largely be attributed to the work of Adrian Davis. So that's a wonderful thing. Now, the, uh, uh, the other thing that was going on about that same time is, tell me about the, the trip to Jerusalem. And, and I understand you met uh, Robin Hood and Maid Marian uh, in this Jerusalem. Right. So they, uh, my, my first office was right downtown Nottingham. Um, and there's uh, Nottingham Castle is uh, on a cliff right downtown. And uh, the Nottingham Castle had been redone, but at the base of the foot of the of the cliff, um, there was the oldest pub in England called the Trip to Jerusalem, where the soldiers would start off there, and um, they would uh, have a have a pint before they went off to war. In any event, um, I decided to go down for a pint before this uh, official opening ceremony um, at the castle. And sure enough, in the trip to Jerusalem in this old pub, I'm sitting down there having a pint and in walks Robin Hood and Maid Marian and sits down across from me. 
I was overwhelmed and overjoyed. Um, it turns out that they had been hired to show up at the uh, reception later on that evening on the castle of the opening ceremonies, but I didn't know that at the time. So it was quite a thrill for me to have a pint across from Maid Marian and Robin Hood. Wow. And uh, so during that same time, uh, you did some study with Gunnar Font up in uh, Stockholm as well. Yes, I also had applied uh, for a grant when I was looking to work in the Europe to work with Gunnar Font in Stockholm, and that was awarded, and Mark Haggard allowed me to go there for two months. Gunnar Font um, basically invented speech synthesis and uh, I think should have um, received the Nobel Prize. Uh, he you know, wrote the equations. He had a wall full of racks where you could generate an E or an A ah or U, different speech sounds. And that was the very first time anybody had ever designed uh, speech synthesis. So it was a very amazing place. Um, and he, I, my favorite story about that is that he, we had a, a, a lunch meeting every, every uh, day and um, people from all around Europe were there. Um, and one lunch period, someone stood up and said that he thought that it was very important about when people are thinking and talking and some people scratch their forehead and some people scratch their, their chin and some people scratch the back of their head. And that has to do with their thought processes. And Gunnar Font listened patiently. And when he was finished, Gunnar Font stood up and said, well, that's interesting because when I think about something, I usually scratch my rear end. And he stood up and scratched his rear end as he was saying it. <laughs> so that was a hey, big laugh for the lunch period. He, even some of the best of the researchers worldwide are still people just like the rest of us. Uh, it's a a really interesting kind of uh, thing to see how many uh, individuals are just guys and or ladies that have grown up and uh, and they still have a life in addition to what they do mm -hmm. for uh, their profession. Yeah, he actually uh, also, I can say, he actually also took me out to his uh, home, which is a small home um, for uh, dinner one evening, and it was a real treat. It was uh, there was no road nearby it at all. It was he had to walk through the forest to get to the home. Wow, it's very special. Kind of like the kind of like Hansel and Gretel looking for uh, looking for things. Um, so now, my uh, I understand your first interest in tinnitus came from a 1981 SIBA conference uh, on tinnitus. Right. So when I was working in Nottingham, uh, there was a group uh, interested in tinnitus, and that's when things were first starting to get interesting, I think, in terms of the research efforts and clinical services. And Ross Coles, who uh, uh, worked closely with me, and I learned quite a bit, uh, invited me to participate in what I believe was the very first conference on tinnitus, the 1981 SIBA conference. Um, so that was a real thrill for me to meet with all these people, um, David Kemp and Charles Berlin and many, many others that were all involved in studying tinnitus. And it was just fascinating to hear the different perspectives and the different theories and the potential treatments. So it was a motivating factor to get me involved in tinnitus. And we all have some place where we kind of, there's some kind of a critical thing that gets us into a particular area uh, for some reason. But also during that time, I, I, I understand you even met with a member of parliament, which, which had to be pretty, pretty good for a Canadian guy uh, from British parents. Right. So um, one of the uh, members of parliament that actually helped get the Institute of Hearing Research started was Jack Ashley. Um, he was an MP, as they refer to them. And um, I had some interactions with him and um, he basically invited me to come down to London and meet with him at the Houses of Parliament. And I uh, was thrilled to do that. Um, took the train down from Nottingham and actually ended up having tea in the uh, gardens on the bank of the Thames River. Wow. Uh, with Jack Ashley, and it was a real thrill. Again, given my parents are, were British and from uh, 
East London, it was a real treat for me to uh, be there at the Houses of Parliament, having tea, um, looking over the Thames. And so it was a real uh, thrill for me to be able to talk with Jack Ashley about his his tinnitus and hearing loss. And uh, he eventually wrote a book on his experience as well. So that was uh, important for me. So, so now comes the interest in cochlear implants, Rich, and, uh, and, and brought you kind of back to Iowa uh, in the early 80s. Right. So I was looking forward to coming back to either Canada or the U.S. and uh, looked around for a job, and there was a job in Iowa. And uh, it turns out that uh, I was hired by Brian McCabe, a physician who was the head of the Department of Otolaryngology in Iowa City. Um, so I knew Iowa City was a good place to live and uh, uh, got the job. So uh, I worked with uh, Bruce Gantz, and he and I were co-principal investigators in a series of P50 NIH grants on cochlear implants. So it was a very exciting time for me to come back to Iowa to get involved in cochlear implants and uh, was very Fun to be in Iowa City and uh, get involved in cochlear implants. Well, but but at that time, cochlear implants were still single channel devices. Yeah, some of them. I had actually had some grants when I was still in in the UK um, and studied uh, some of the single channel implants, um, and uh, some of them were actually just you being used to help people lip read to vibrate. And uh, I sometimes say I thought my job uh, was to prove that that uh, cochlear implants did not work because they was quite controversial at the time. Um, and if they were just uh, helping people lip read, maybe you could do that just as easily with the vibrations on your skin. Uh, it was also interesting because uh, they were quite uh, controversial at the time uh, in the sense that a lot of the people from the deaf culture were opposed to cochlear implants. And we had some meetings, uh, I remember one in Paris, where uh, a cochlear implant meeting, um, and there were picket lines outside from uh, people from the deaf culture. Wow. Uh, so that actually motivated me. And I wrote an article on cochlear implants in the deaf culture to try and help both sides understand the other side um, because it's uh, changed their life. Many, of course, deaf children are born with hearing parents. A lot of times, uh, uh, as as we enter into the field of audiology and people start with cochlear implants, uh, it's difficult for hearing people to understand why there is a a an issue with the uh, with the deaf community. Um, but uh, they refer to cochlear implants, particularly at that time as the medicalization of the deaf. And, and, and it was one of those things that, that uh, uh, for a while, uh, I couldn't understand why anybody wouldn't want to have their child be able to hear. But culturally, it's, it's quite a different world. Yeah, and, and again, um, there were sort of two groups of people. The, the, the parents of deaf children are, are hearing people, generally speaking, not always, but generally speaking, and they want to be able to communicate with their with their young children, of course. And uh, adults that are deaf want to be able to uh, to show that they're okay with their sign language. They can communicate. They're smart people. They're productive, and they can be friendly, and uh, that's fine. So uh, that's okay, um, but I think it was tr true that that uh, less of an issue now that for hearing parents to want to have uh, children that hear with cochlear implants is acceptable, and that uh, worked out in the long run. Uh, and and as part of that uh, position and and your interest in cochlear implants, you started the international conference in Iowa on cochlear implants. Yes, we had the first international conference on cochlear implants. Um, it was uh, wonderful. And uh, again, the, the field has evolved um, in such an impressive way um, with the different uh, 
different companies involved in the in the progress and how much better uh, patients here with cochlear implants now than they did initially. So it's uh, amazing how the whole field has evolved in the right direction. Well, and uh, and and even worked with Bill House a little bit from what uh, from what we've what we've discussed as well. Yeah, I was quite thrilled. Uh, Bill House, uh, who developed the uh, cochlear implant, um, I was quite thrilled with one of the number one otologists maybe in the world. Uh, and he called me and uh, we had a few interactions and uh, I actually was invited to go out uh, to visit him and he uh, made uh, dinner for me on his yacht just south of Los Angeles. And wow. I had another meeting north of Los Angeles uh, four or five days later and Adrian Davis was coming over from Europe to attend that meeting with me. And so I thought, well, maybe we can, maybe we can camp for three or four days in Los Angeles. Uh, I grew up camping with my parents and it was an inexpensive way to spend the three or four days in Los Angeles. Yeah, but not in Los Angeles though, right? Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> of course, well, there's quite I, a few people camping in Los Angeles these days, but anyway. Yeah, well, I, at the time I didn't, I didn't, there was no, no, uh, no, no national campgrounds in Los Angeles, <laughs> but there, there was one on um, Catalina Island um, off of uh, Los Angeles. And so I, uh, I convinced Adrian Davis we would camp uh, there for three or four days. We flew out um, from uh, south of L.A. onto the island. Uh, I had the, uh, my suit and tie on, and we um, I had clothes in one suitcase. And in the other suitcase, I brought a little small tent and uh, sleeping bags for Adrian and I and some food. And... Uh, Got picked up on the, in the airport and drove to the other side of the island, uh, into the campground. This guy dropped us off, and we were sort of out in the wilderness. It was there was no picnic tables or numbers on campsites, um, but uh, looked like a beautiful area. And this um, this park ranger came over in a in a jeep eventually and said, "Hey, you're not supposed to be here." and uh, I said, well, we're here to camp. And he said, no, no, this is a campground. And we were there with our suit and ties and suitcases. And he didn't believe that we were going to camp. And so he eventually said, okay, you can camp. And I said, well, where's our campsite? And he said, well, you camp anywhere you want. And then as he, as he left, he said, uh, just watch out for the wild boars. I didn't know what a wild boar was, but uh, Adrian and I had a nice day. We set up the pup tent. Uh, that night, uh, in the middle of the night, uh, I'm sound. We're sound asleep, and I hear. Uh, uh, looked outside the little pup tent, and there were three or four wild boars that were actually larger than our tent. And I didn't know what to do. Adrian was fast asleep, and the wild boars got closer and closer. Finally, I shouted, "Get out of here! Get out of here!" And the wild boars took off. And Adrian Davis stood up and took our tent down. So it was an uh, interesting experience uh, dealing with the wild boars and with Adrian. Oh, and I and I understand that uh, that's about the same time as 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 you began to, well, maybe a little bit later, you began to move toward toward the International Hearing Aid Conference, and uh, uh, in in the early '90s, I think, if I remember right. Yeah, so I um, developed some, uh, you know, we were doing hearing aid work as well as our cochlear implant work and had the world's first um, international hearing aid conference in Iowa City. Um, and I invited Dennis Byrne and uh, that was uh, established quite a nice working relationship with Dennis. Um, I went back to um, Sydney uh, to visit him a few times. And on one of the first times I had gave a talk at the National Acoustics Laboratory um, suggesting that you might not want to fit hearing aids based on thresholds. Uh, Dennis's approach, you should consider um, fitting hearing aids based on loudness levels so that you're equ equating the um, loudness of the speech frequency um, to the individual's uh, loudness perception in hearing impaired people. 
and I published an article on that, but nobody's paid attention. That's okay. And well, that, that was the same. That that was the time when Dennis was the was the world's guru in uh, fitting hearing aids. So against the grain is is kind of good sometimes for sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, he he um, was able to accept me <laughs> as a friend <laughs> and colleague, and we had several wine tasting parties both in uh, Australia and actually in Iowa. He came to Iowa a couple of times and. Um, Worked out with, uh, took me on a wine tour in uh, north of uh, Sydney and introduced me to Bill Noble. And so Bill Noble was a visiting professor here, and I was able to do some great work with Bill Noble as well um, in the hearing and cochlear implant areas. So the uh, uh, this begins kind of a, a time when you began to focus on tinnitus. Uh, and and understand that that it even started with at, at the source of the tinnitus uh, movement, which was Dr. Jack Vernon. Yeah, Jack was doing uh, physiological research, and one of one patient contacted him and uh, took Jack to um, a fountain in Portland, um, and told Jack. Uh, this is the only place where I don't hear my tinnitus. And that's what gave Jack the idea to create a tinnitus masker. So this was the world's first strategy to have a wearable device that sounded like a fountain waterfalls um, that would uh, mask or partially mask your tinnitus. And that's what got the Maskers going. So I uh, had a wonderful time working with Jack over the years. Um, had dinner on his boat once with he and Mary, and it was uh, quite a treat for me. Well, and, and you also became the Scientific Advisory Committee Director for the American Tinnitus Association, uh, from what I understand also. And, and, uh, and, and as I gather, uh, that was about the same time as the Blues Brothers were really pretty hot, and and you kind of um, amplified that at, a, at at Jack's retirement party. Right. So um, I was invited to participate in Jack's retirement party and gave a little speech, but they was a formal event, and uh, I didn't own a tuxedo. I was generally a pretty informal guy in general, <laughs> so. Um, I dressed up in my costume that I had with uh, dark sunglasses and a hat as one of the Blues Brothers. And um, it was quite a treat at the um, reception and the dance following the retirement party. Uh, I think well appreciated. Well, you know, it, to, to watch Rich Tyler do somersaults and, uh, and sing in the microphone, I think I'd pay quite a lot to see that. Uh, <laughs> Now, um, this was about the same time that you opened the Tintus Clinic at the University of Iowa. Yeah, it was, um, you know, uh, as I said, I learned a lot from Jack, and uh, it was clearly uh, a need that uh, this tinnitus patients weren't not being helped, generally speaking. And so uh, we decided to get things moving and uh, opened up a tinnitus clinic in Iowa City. Um, and I really enjoyed uh, that. And part of the problem, this was quite interesting. I had uh, uh, several people help me over the years, including Shelley Witt and um, uh, others, but it was really important to see that we could actually help these patients. But uh, in the hospital setting, it was also interesting because uh, getting paid for the services was not always clear. And I joined several different committees on trying to resolve this and see how it would work for several different uh, audiology organizations. And uh, it's still a challenge, I think. Um, we can certainly help these patients, um, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it can be a challenge in making it work and getting reimbursed for our services. And and this is the time too that that the conference changed its focus to the International Tinnitus Conference uh, again now in its thirtieth year this year. 
Yeah, so it's, um, you know, we've had this conference for many, many years, um, tried to focus on, and initially and particularly, tried to focus on getting other professionals, um, including audiologists and psychologists, interested in helping tinnitus patients and letting them know what to do. And indeed, that also included getting companies motivated to produce uh, sound therapy devices. And so we always had uh, interaction with companies and with professionals. Uh, I tried to get um, you know people that were well-versed in helping distressed patients in general, not just about tinnitus, but just about things in their life in general, because some of the tinnitus patients are indeed quite distressed and need our support. And so uh, it was very helpful to get help from uh, people like psychologist Annette Moore in Denmark, who has taught me a lot about connecting with patients and being helpful to distressed patients. Well, I think that's one of the main things in tinnitus treatment is just letting uh, tinnitus p- patients know that someone's listening and and that and that it is a real kind of an issue and and the, the kinds of things that all of us have learned in our tinnitus treatment over the years. But I think one of the highlights of my t- attendance at the uh, tinnitus and hyperacusis uh, conference has to be uh, the round barn at Rich's house. Yeah, well, I'm sorry to hear you say that. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it, it, it was uh, the social highlight. Let's put I, that I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding, it's okay. So um, many, many years ago, I acquired a, a, a round barn just outside of Iowa City uh, that's referred to as the Seacrest 1883 octagonal barn. And I've had several grants to re- help with the restoration. I met many volunteers, artists, photographers. It's been a real uh, treat for me to be able to restore this and to meet lots of different people in helping do this. Um, so we always have uh, a barbecue and a square dance in the round barn for all of our meetings in Iowa City. And the sad thing is, when I go and give some paper in Europe or China, people don't ask me, how's my research? They ask me, how's the round barn? <laughs> which, which is terrible. Well, in, uh, and, in, in, and 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 we all become famous for some things. Uh, these days I have people ask me, how's the old Studebaker doing? Uh, that kind of thing. So, uh, well, the, the, American Speech Language Hearing Association awarded the 2008 Editor's Award for the article uh, for article of the highest merit to you and colleagues that put together a volume there. Yes, Claudia Colio, uh, Pantau, Helena Yi, uh, and Geringer, Stephanie Gogol, and William Noble and I published uh, an article on identifying tentative subgroups. I think that um, one of the one of the problems um, in solving the issues with tinnitus is that there are likely different mechanisms and um, therefore likely different strategies for helping these patients. So in clinical trials, we need to focus on different subgroups and be able to measure those differences accurately. And uh, for example, a drug might help some tinnitus subgroup, but not others. So if we can find out uh, who that sub, what that subgroup is uh, based on uh, the history and based on psychoacoustical measures of the tinnitus will be in a better shape, a better position to find the subgroups and to be helpful in treating these tinnitus patients. And then uh, uh, you've received uh, a couple, at least a couple of inventor recognition awards from the University of Iowa as well. Yeah, I've um, been helped by many people, including uh, one example is Jay Rubenstein um, in looking at the potential of electrical stimulation um, to help tinnitus patients. So uh, we did work on cochlear implants. Some people who get cochlear implants say that, oh, they can hear better, but even better than that, their tinnitus is gone. So um, we did some preliminary trials uh, to use both intracochlear and extracochlear stimulation 
and tennis patients and looked at different um, stimulation rates and different uh, stimulation locations uh, to try and suppress tinnitus with electrical stimulation. And I think there's still great potential from that. And uh, uh, I think that will eventually um, may even be a device focused primarily on tinnitus with electrical stimulation uh, to be able to help some patients. So um, now there's there's an award that's called the Lasker Award. And, and I didn't know what the Lasker Award was until we began discussing it. And my understanding is it's kind of an equivalent to the uh, to an American Nobel Prize. Yeah, so this is perhaps the highlight of my career. Um, I didn't know what it was either, but uh, Blake Wilson contacted me and invited me. I think everybody, they awarded this uh, to Graham Clark, Ingeborg Hochmeyer, and Blake Wilson. And everybody got to invite, I forget exactly, six or seven people. So Blake Wilson invited me. So um, the game, this is the equivalent of the Nobel Prize from the United States. And the and this was awarded um, in 2013 to these three individuals for their contributions to the cochlear implant field. So um, they had a special dinner and I was asked to provide a toast to the uh, to the awardees. So I um, gave a toast and awarded um, my uh, kind wishes and provided some background for Graham Clark, Ingeborg Hochmeyer, and Blake Wilson. And uh, in addition to that, I uh, gave some stories about uh, key people that had helped them in the fields. And that included Erwin Hochmeyer, Mike Dorman, and Jim Patrick. So um, I gave this uh, speech and uh, was thrilled to be able to be part of this award because I had been involved in knowing these people um, clearly and following their careers and interacting with them uh, over the years to see how cochlear implants had evolved and become uh, accepted and worthwhile. Um, the My speech, my welcoming uh, address uh, at this Lasker Awards was actually recorded um, and is available on YouTube. The um, we had that, team. I think, as a as a uh, something that they can click on and and uh, and and review too, Rich. If we need to, Good. that's wonderful. I hope people have a look at that. It's the thrill of my my career. Yeah, it's a uh, the the quality isn't good of the video, but the quality of the audio is really exceptional. Yeah. But uh, more than that, I, I gather you're a didgeridoo player. Right. Well, um, the I guess this is sort of a problem that um, at a, a later date, I was uh, invited to go to Sydney, Australia, and I was awarded at this ceremony uh, a didgeridoo by Graham Clark. Now, I failed music in grade two, so I'm not really up on things in terms of music. But uh, it was quite a thrill to be awarded this. Um, and I've tried a little bit here and there um, from Glam, Graham Clark. So that was a real one of the thrills of my careers. Well, I, I understand that just blowing one of those things is a little bit tough. So uh, so just being able to 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 make it make some sounds is, is quite quite a feat. And and so how has audiology changed from your first trip abroad? to maybe your last trip abroad. I know a lot of us who have had some international experience, you know, in the in the 80s and 90s, there wasn't much going on in our profession. But by the time we, uh, we get into the 2000s, things have changed quite a lot. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, I guess um, I can say in my first, uh, some of the first trips that I had, um, there just wasn't a lot of even, you know, people were just starting to measure hearing in some places. Uh, yeah. You know, I 
my memorable trip was I went to China, Beijing in 1988. Um, there were traffic jams everywhere with bicycles. There was no cars. All the buildings in downtown Beijing were two stories or one story. And there were blocked toilets. So it was a total different life. But they were, I was there to help them with their first cochlear implant. And, you know, they were had some uh, sites to test hearing, but it was pretty minimal. Um, and uh, in those early days, people were getting more interested in not just pure tone thresholds, measuring pure tone threshold loss, but also speech perception and not just repeating individual words, but uh, hearing uh, words with background words, hearing uh, uh, background sounds coming from different directions and not just uh, hearing words, but also localizing where sounds were coming from. So at least in the research field, um, it was becoming more in those cochlear implant days, um, more realistic, I'll say. Um, and of course, today, uh, there's so much available on your smartphone, and it's affecting the healthcare uh, field in general, among other things. And uh, in some ways, this is very, very helpful because people can get uh, some tests and some ideas and things uh, remotely. But it's also a challenge in some ways because uh, not all of the things available online are valid. There may very well be inaccuracies and sometimes it may prevent somebody from going and getting um, getting their hearing tested properly and getting fit with hearing aids or cochlear implants or getting appropriate tinnitus counseling that would benefit from them. So there are some clear benefits from the high technology and interacting that is uh, available now, but there are also some shortcomings. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how things move, but I think that um, uh, in the long run, it's still gonna be beneficial for individuals that are distressed uh, about their hearing loss or their tinnitus or that uh, need special fittings of uh, cochlear implants or hearing aids to see uh, professionals uh, in their offices and not do things remotely. So it'll be interesting to see how things evolve. I, I think if I remember correctly, Rich, you, uh, uh, you kind of refused to take a ride in an ambulance uh, during that China trip as well. Right. So when I was in Beijing, um, I was uh, um, asked by the physician uh, in the local hospital if I would uh, go out to the number one school for the deaf. And uh, I said, I'd be happy to do that. And he said, well, I'll come around in a car and pick you up in the morning. And as I said, there were all bicycles everywhere. I hadn't seen a car in Beijing and so I said, where does the car come from? And he said, well, it's used as the ambulance for the hospital. And I said, well, how do you get to the number one school for the deaf? And he says, well, I go by bicycle. And I said, well, get me a bicycle. And I'll, so I think I rented a bicycle for a dollar for the week. And uh, we rode by bicycle uh, for, I don't know, 45 minutes out to the number one school for the deaf. The principal said uh, she was pleased to meet me. I was not the first Westerner to come to the number one school for the deaf in Beijing, but I was the first one to arrive on bicycle. So maybe that was kind of a thrill. Well, you know, and and we we many of us have had some fabulous experiences uh, abroad and and so on. But I can say that there's very very few of us that ever got to take Miss America to dinner. Right. So. Uh... Um, Heather Whitestone uh, came to Iowa City um, many years ago. She was the Miss America in 1995 and had a profound hearing loss and received a cochlear implant. So she eventually wrote a book, Listening With My Heart, but I uh, was fortunate and uh, privileged to be able to take her to dinner in Iowa City. That was a very pleasant uh, experience. Well, that's that's something that not many, not many guys get to do for sure. So, 
Uh, but I, I want to call the, uh, our colleagues' attention to the fact that you are the 2023 recipient of the Jurger Career Award in Research uh, in Audiology by the American Academy of Audiology. Uh, and, and very well deserved. And uh, you've led us all into the area of tinnitus, cochlear implants, and many other areas as well, Rich. And uh, so congratulations from not only myself this weekend hearing, but, but audiologists in general. Thank you. I was quite thrilled and quite surprised to receive the Sturger Career Award. And uh, as I said, I've worked with many, many different people around the world together and uh, with them and with their help and with their input and learned from many other people uh, the importance of uh, hearing, the importance of helping people with distressed uh, situations because of their tinnitus and hyperacusis and it's really been a major factor in my career to have been able to work with so many clever people from around the world so i'm quite thrilled to be able to um, receive the sugar research career award well one of the things that 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 we've observed recently i'd say relatively recently is that uh, is that many audiology clinics are now moving toward uh, becoming not just a hearing center, but a hearing and tinnitus center. Um, how how do you see that changing the uh, profession uh, for the for the future for tinnitus patients? Well, I think it's a great thing. I think, you know, there is no cure at this point. Um, again, I think there might be some cures uh, with particular subgroups of tinnitus patients, but at this point, um, there is no cure. And of course, we've known for decades that the pure tone thresholds are not the only way of measuring hearing loss. And so I think that um, there's a great potential here for interacting with patients um, not just uh, in the clinic, but as we said, also through smartphones. And I think it's a wonderful thing that um, there are more and more professionals getting involved in helping these patients. And I think that um, with a focus, not just on you know helping them with their hearing, but also with the counseling, I think that um, there's opportunities now um, and as we said, some advantages and some complications with things online, but I think there's uh, wonderful opportunities now for helping these needy patients. Um, and the profession is uh, opening up and uh, now connecting with more tinnitus patients than they ever did. And there's a lot more options in helping patients with tinnitus and with hyperacusis and with hearing difficulties. So I think that there's training programs and uh, more detailed personalized counseling programs. Uh, professionals are being trained better and um, professionals are now working with smartphone apps and things. So it's gonna be complicated, as I mentioned. Uh, there'll be some apps and things that are not helpful and some people that will be put off. But I think that in general, uh, there's great potential here for helping patients and the profession is expanding its horizon um, to include tinnitus and to include hyperacusis. And uh, I think we'll be able to help more patients and be able to do a better job helping them um, based on the expansion of our training. I, I think I would be remiss in our discussion, Rich, if I, if I didn't say something about the fact that uh, during my time as chair of ABA, we, we, we were trying to find a a uh, some sort of a certification for uh, for people that that were interested in treating tinnitus patients, and and as I remember, you know, and and when we first started talking about that, um, people were saying things like, uh, "How do you get uh, a group of people that are treating tinnitus uh, all to agree on anything?" I mean, it's like putting putting cats in a bag and watching them fight. Uh, and you were able to take that group as one of the leaders there and, and 
put a cohesive group of 20 people together to come up with uh, a tinnitus certificate, which is now the, um, the, the certificate holder tinnitus management certificate from the American uh, Board of Audiology. Yeah, well, I think that obviously we're all different. We come back from different training procedures and different experiences in life. And um, I think we all have to appreciate that, um, you know, these different perspectives um, need to be listened to. And, um, you know, although we are trained in one particular way, there might be some other training. And as I said, I've learned a lot from psychologists um, and also uh, other audiologists. And, you know, my opinions on helping people have changed over the years. And I think that uh, we just have to be a good listener and realize that uh, we're not always right and that uh, there's different perspectives and all the patients are different and might need different approaches. And so um, it's useful to uh, have an open mind and to be a good listener and uh, to try and work together. And uh, it may very well be that um, useful for us if we try something new every now and again and see where that goes. So I, I think it's um, it's important to realize that we're, we're different people and we come from different backgrounds, but uh, it's good to be a good listener sometimes too. Absolutely. Well, Rich, in addition to the tinnitus management certificate, uh, I understand that Subsequently, you've introduced some some questionnaires and so on that can be of assistance in tinnitus management, as well as in the research that goes on in the tinnitus area. Yes, absolutely. I think this is very important. Um, we developed the tinnitus primary functions questionnaire, and that uh, helps direct uh, counseling, first of all, because... Um, Patients are different and they can be affected by their tinnitus in different ways. So for example, they can be affected by their thoughts and emotions. The tinnitus can affect their hearing. The tinnitus can affect their sleep or the tinnitus can affect their concentration. And so the tinnitus primary functions questionnaire can help direct uh, which areas they need treatment in or not. And also in terms of research, the tinnitus primary function questionnaire has been translated worldwide and uh, it's very sensitive to different treatments. For example, if someone does not have any problems sleeping, then those questions on sleep can be ignored before and after the uh, treatment scheduled. So that makes the questionnaire very, very sensitive. So thoughts and emotions hearing, sleep, and concentration, the four areas affected by tinnitus, different in different people. So the questionnaire can be used to direct uh, counseling and the correction, the questionnaire can be also used to focus on the effectiveness in clinical trials. In addition to that, um, in our studies, I've seen that the different quality of life scales hardly even touch on the topic of hearing. So these quality of life scales are used by many uh, healthcare systems around the world, um, putting out uh, allocations for funding for different treatments and so on. And they hardly even mention the aspects and the importance of hearing. So we developed a new questionnaire called the Meaning of Life questionnaire. And this has been published a couple of years ago that helps uh, people and helps re re researchers and helps healthcare communities, I hope worldwide, appreciate the importance of hearing in our lives. And uh, the previous quality of life scales do not, um, do not magnify that importance of communicating. So it's uh, the meaning of life questionnaire that we just published a couple of years ago. Now, we could just kind of Google those, and they should probably pop up, wouldn't you think? Yeah, I can send you the information that you want. I can send you the articles. or. Well, that's, that's good. So either Google these or uh, contact Dr. Tyler, and he'll uh, help yeah. you find these yeah. particular questionnaires. And uh, 
Well, uh, this kind of concludes our, our, our discussion today, Rich, but uh, certainly uh, I want to thank Dr. Tyler for his time, energy, and effort that, that went into our discussion uh, today. Uh, thank you for being with us at Giants in Audiology. What an example for all of us to follow uh, in, the, in a career development and, uh, and, and in, in a successful career. On behalf of audiologists uh, worldwide, thank you for your contributions to our profession, as well as the development of audiology uh, in the world, uh, in, the, in the world environment. Um, and I hope that all of you uh, as listeners to Giants in Hearing will join me in Seattle at the American Academy of Audiology Honors Ceremony Banquet, where my good friend and colleague, Dr. Rich Tyler will receive the 2023 Jurger Career Award in Research uh, Audiology. So thank you for being with us today at This Week in Hearing. Thank you, I'm honored. <laughs>